Now the latest ITV news in the calendar region with Ian White and Lara Rostran. Hello, a very good evening to you. Welcome to ITV News and to Wednesday night's calendar. We're coming to you live from Scampton on the day campaigners were told a decision by the Home Office to turn the nearby RAF base or former RAF base into a processing centre for asylum seekers was lawful. On tonight's programme, we'll sift through today's decision to work out what it means for the future of the former RAF base. We'll be live in Westminster with the latest reaction and we'll find out just what Scampton means to those lucky enough to have worked at the airbase and shared its rich history. Well, hello, a very good evening to you. Thank you very much for joining us for this special edition of Calendar coming to you from Scampton in Lincolnshire. And, uh, well, if you're wondering why I'm in the pub, it's because I'm in the Dam Busters Inn in Scampton. It's the hub of the community, and it's also celebrating the history of 617 Squadron, the famous Dam Busters, of course. And this community has been at the centre of a huge row. Today, though, that came to an end, or for the time being at least. The High Court judge has ruled that a Home Office plan to house up to 2,000 asylum seekers at the former RAF Scampton Air Base was lawful. It follows a two-day judicial review last month. So how did we get to this point? Emma Wilkinson has today's top story. After nine months of campaigning, the wait for this judgment was an anxious one for Sarah. But before it was officially published this afternoon, news started to filter through that they'd lost. On the residence Facebook group. Yeah, where have you got that from? The confusion was brief as soon the news she'd feared was confirmed. I'm really disappointed. Really mm. disappointed. But it, there's no, not on any terms is our fight over. It's not right for anyone. It's not right for, for Lincoln, for us residents. It's not right for the companies with the investment, but as well it's not right for the asylum seekers. For months, local people have watched this site gradually take shape as accommodation for asylum seekers, despite the efforts of the local council to stop it. Residents have protested, held public meetings, they've even camped outside. But they felt powerless watching lorries bring portable cabins onto the tarmac where they once watched the Red Arrows taking off. This is a base with a long and significant history. Scampton RAF station treasures a Lancaster bomber that made a mockery of Goering's boast that we should never bomb Germany. There have been many chapters in the story of RAF Scampton, but many in this community have fought for the most recent to be rewritten. When the base officially closed last year, the disappointment was briefly replaced with optimism as big investment plans were revealed to redevelop the site. But the Home Office had other ideas. These will be scaled up over the coming months and will collectively provide accommodation to several thousand asylum seekers. That announcement was set against a backdrop of record numbers of people arriving in small boats, a daily bill of more than six million pounds to house people in hotels and a huge backlog of asylum cases. So for the government, this is part of the solution to that. They had claimed that the risk of asylum seekers becoming homeless was an emergency that meant it could bypass normal planning rules in order to get accommodation up and running here as quickly as possible. West Lindsay District Council have always felt that that wasn't lawful. But the High Court has ruled today that the government's use of emergency powers was appropriate and Kevin agrees. He lives in Lincolnshire and was once a chief immigration officer with the Border Force. It's cheaper, it's more efficient from uh, the point of view of uh, the Home Office dealing with the asylum applicants to be able to go to one place rather than five or six different hotels. And it's easier to monitor. But campaigners and those living in the shadow of the base are more worried than ever about the consequences of this now going ahead. It's a very, very scary time. Um, for them to be, you know, to not know that what, who, who these people are, you know, 2,000 people 
live in, you know, mere 100 metres away from, from their houses. It's not meaning anything against the people that are going to come here because we don't know who they are or what they're going to be like. But it's just the unknown of having that many men, 2,000 men, in close proximity all together in one place. I don't know, it's just gutting. It's just absolutely gutting. And those were the words uttered by many here today because this is a place that's more than just a military base to them. It's part of the fabric of their community. Well, I'm joined now by Sarah, who you saw in Emma's report there, and also by Terry Rumble. You live near the base, of course, both of you, and you've been campaigning against this ruling, um, this decision. Um, that's it then, isn't it? That's it. You've, you've lost it today. No, definitely not. This was just round one. Um, the, the court case was based around um, using Section Q, <coughs> excuse me, and um, the next bit will be the special development order that the Home Office will apply for, so it will be fighting them on that next. So that's your next thing to do? Yep. Wow, and how are you feeling about that? Um, optimistic. We're going to be appealing to um, MPs across the country, so we've got a big task ahead of us, but um, yeah, we'll, we'll do whatever's necessary. Terry. Despite that and what Sarah said there, is there a feeling that this is an unstoppable train and this is just something that's going to happen anyway? I think it will probably happen, if I'm honest, um, but we're going to do our level best to, to stop it and prevent it. Um, um, the, the problem is, as far as I'm concerned, that we're constantly being told under the latest immigration bill that these are not asylum seekers, that these are illegal immigrants. So today's judicial review uh, result confuses me because it only refers to asylum seekers and I don't really understand uh, why it's been approved. Do you ever, Sarah, think about, you know, we, we talk about asylum seekers, we talk about illegal immigrants, but do you ever think about the individuals that are involved and what they've gone through? Yeah, of course we do, but th this, this has been created by the Home Office not doing their job properly for the last sort of 10 plus years, which has created a problem that they're then putting on to us. So although we do, yeah, I wouldn't want to be living there. It's basically going to be a concentration camp. I don't think anyone would want to live there. The Home Office say they're going to work very closely with West Lindsay District Council to make sure that this is actually something that will work. Well, that remains to be seen whether it'll work or not, but my, my overriding feeling is that, you know, you know, these people are coming from France, um, and why don't they claim asylum in France? France isn't a dangerous place to live. People like Sarah and I and many others go there for a holiday. So you have to ask the question, why do they risk their lives crossing the channel to come to the Great Britain? So you just don't want them here? I don't have a problem with uh, asylum seekers at all, or refugees, genuine refugees. I housed a Ukrainian family for six months. I uh, am fearful of 2,000 young fighting age men, as the Home Office call them, um, swamping out five or 600 residents at Scampton. All right. Well, look, thank you very much indeed for, for giving us your views tonight on Calvin. Thank you very much indeed. Well, uh, we mentioned West Lindsay District Council, of course, who uh, brought about this judicial review, and our reporter Amelia Beckett has been talking to them about today's decision. Ian, thank you. Yes, I'm outside West Lindsay District Council offices in Gainsborough this evening, and I'm joined by the Director of Planning, Sally Grinrod-Smith. Sally, you've been living and breathing this case since March, really. Lots of twists and turns, but today, ultimately, the decision that the Home Office plans are lawful. How would you feel? So it's been a fascinating day. Obviously, the judgment was handed down. We didn't know fully what was in that judgment. Um, and what we have seen, that despite the claims being dismissed by Justice Thornton, she has granted the opportunity to immediately appeal that decision, which tells us there is something in there that requires further investigation. And ultimately, that is the use of Class Q, the government's emergency powers. So uh, yet another twist and turn in the story here. Yeah, we'll just go into that Class Q because it's a bit complicated. So it's emergency powers that basically the court has said the asylum situation is an emergency. That's the case, isn't it? So you have to remember that what the judicial review was considering was the position in March of this year. So much water under the bridge and time has passed now. So what you'll see when you read into the detail of the judgment is that Justice Thornton was very clear that actually the proposals to use the site for longer than 12 months were well established in March of this year. So there's a, there's a real challenge here in terms of the environmental impact 
impact assessment screening opinion and if you remember I described that as the key to unlock class Q so whilst the judgment tells us that in the position of an emergency class Q can apply actually there is still a very murky area here around the Home Office not having completed the correct screening assessment for a development that's going to go on beyond the 12 months of Class Q. So as you mentioned, a murky area, some uncertainties. Are you planning to appeal this judgment? So that will be a decision that Western Sea District Council now needs to take. You know, there's a litigation process there. What that means is we've been given the opportunity to consider that decision and that's very much where we wanted to be at this moment in time. Sally, thank you very much. So as you heard there, potential for appeal. This isn't over yet. You might be hearing the Christmas music in the background at the moment. Not quite the Christmas present they were hoping for today. OK, Amelia Beckett, thank you very much indeed. In fact, we'll catch up with you later on the programme. Thanks very much, Amelia, for that. Um, now, we've been talking about these redevelopment plans, haven't we? What exactly are those all about? It was back in February when West Lindsay District Council decided to uh, vote in favour, in fact, unanimously, to uh, acquire the Scampton site and partner up with the developer Scampton Holidays. Holy. Its grand plans for the site promise £300 million of investment that would not only be a levelling up opportunity for Lincolnshire, but could create a national centre of excellence for aerospace technology. It envisages a number of different zones, including one for hotels and leisure, a heritage area with a museum and visitor centre, an education zone, an area for space technology, and the site would have an operational runway once again. Well, a little earlier I spoke to the chairman of Scampton Holdings, Peter Hewitt, and I began by asking him for his reaction to today's ruling. Well, naturally, we're disappointed, but I think the, uh, the reality of this is that, that it, it clears the way now for perhaps a more open discussion with the Home Office, whereas when litigation was pending, then I suspect there was a, a natural reluctance to engage with us. But hopefully, this will mean that we can start to have some sensible conversations. So you've not heard anything from the Home Office as yet? Not as yet, no. Um, the MP, uh, Sir Edward Lee, has, has been in touch, I understand, with um, uh, Robert Jenrick, um, but that was uh, last week rather than this week. So, uh, in all honesty, nothing heard from the Home Office at all uh, so far. Is this the end of the line or is it perhaps an opportunity to appeal this decision? Well, my understanding is there is an opportunity to appeal. Now, whether or not West Lindsay, who are leading the case, will decide to do that or not is yet to be determined. But from our perspective, the most important thing is to get on site as soon as we can and try and get this development going because, uh, frankly, people's lives in Scampton and around are, are, are on hold. And it's been a very, very as you, important issue to the locals, as you will know, because it's affected them in so many different ways. And uh, the, the sort of slightly frustrating thing, in fact, indeed, the very, very frustrating thing is we're having approaches from major international aerospace companies who want to come and use Scampton to develop and to put production lines um, of, of their products, and yet we can't tell them anything. Uh, so we're still in this state of limbo, which for a commercial organisation is very frustrating. But there is still a determination from you that you will uh, actually get some benefit out of this in the, in the long run, that there will still be something good come out of this? Well, uh, inevitably I'm an optimist, otherwise I wouldn't be doing this. And so yes, we, we believe ultimately it will all work out and it will all be for the good. Uh, clearly there's, there's been quite a lot of cost involved in the, in the short term and whether one recoups that or not is to be seen. But the, but the most important thing for us is to get this development going, to give some certainty to, the, uh, to Lincolnshire and to Scampton residents in particular as what is going to happen. Mr Hewitt, thank you very much indeed for joining us on Calendar. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, from Scampton Holdings uh, Limited, of course. Um, now then, as you can see here at the Dambusters Inn tonight, it's very busy, always at this time of night, and particularly with Christmas coming up. But there's one subject on everybody's lips tonight, and that is, of course, 
this uh, judicial review uh, ruling today. And it's also something that's been closely scrutinised in Westminster. So let's join our political correspondent, Katie Oscroft, who's there. And Katie, I have to ask you, you know, do you think the government is in celebratory mood tonight? Well, the government will no doubt see this as a big step forward in its attempt to rehome some 50,000 asylum seekers currently in hotels. But I'm joined now by the Conservative MP for Gainsborough, Sir Edward Lee. Um, the festivities have begun behind us here at Westminster, but this is not the Christmas present you wanted, is it? No, it's obviously disappointing, but I understand the council's going to appeal, and I understand they have solid grounds for appeal, so the fight goes on. Do you feel that there is somewhere to go from here, that all is not lost? I don't think it's all is lost, but this could take months now, and I've suggested to the government months ago that they should have been prepared to compromise with West Lindsay, and we could have had just three or four hundred migrants in a remote part of the site, and we could have got, gone on ahead with this wonderful regeneration. And there are some very exciting proposals now which are all being held up and stymied, so I just want to make progress, really. I'll come back to you in a second, Sir Edward, but I spoke earlier to the prospective Labour candidate for Lincoln and he was clear about what he wanted the Home Office to do. They need to speak to the investors. £300 million, which is what the investors are promising, is more than double the total amount of money that the whole of Lincolnshire has got from every levelling up funding in history. This is a massive amount of money and if the government is going to be even a tiny bit responsible, the Home Office needs to open that discussion with Scampton Holdings. Well, Sir Edward, I'm sure you'd agree that this area needs investment, needs money. You have a new Home Secretary now, James Cleverley, has just been on his feet in the Commons talking uh, about the plans to send asylum seekers to Rwanda. Do you have his ear? Well, I've uh, requested a meeting now with James Cleverley and also a meeting uh, with Michael Gove and Kemi Bad Badenoch, the three Cabinet Ministers who are responsible for the Home Department, the Business Department are levelling up. And I really want to bash some heads together because this is completely ridiculous that when we have the biggest bit of levelling up, worth up to £300 million pounds that we've ever had in Lincolnshire, to spend months of taxpayer-funded court cases just arguing over obscure legal points is not the right way to proceed. And we should sit down together and get the regeneration of Scampton up and running. Well, Sir Edward, thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, we did speak to the Home Office, who said, crucially, it will work with councils and key partners to manage the impact. OK, Katie Oscroft, live at Westminster, thank you very much indeed. Now then, uh, thank you very much for being with us for Wednesday night's calendar. Do stay with us because we'll be having a little bit more about the history of Scampton later in the programme and a bit more too about what today's decision means for the people who live around here. First though, let's go back to the studio and join Lara for the rest of today's news. Ian, thank you very much. Now, police have named a man who died after being rescued from a house fire in Hull. Anthony Ibbotson, who was 54, died in hospital on Friday, two days after the fire on Terry Street. Police are treating this as a murder and have released CCTV of a man that they want to speak to. They say they're continuing to conduct extensive lines of inquiry. Just weeks after hundreds of homes in our region were flooded during Storm Babette, a new report says that the government isn't properly prepared for climate disasters. Homes and businesses were flooded in areas like Horncaster, Chesterfield and Catcliffe when Storm Babette brought heavy rainfall in October. The National Audit Office assessed four extreme weather events, storms, droughts, flooding and high temperatures. Its findings show that the Cabinet Office doesn't have an effective strategy in place to respond. Well, the government says it's making excellent progress on building flexible and agile capabilities, systems and strategies, which ensure that the UK is prepared for emerging threats. An important step has been taken towards reopening Doncaster Sheffield Airport today, according to the city's mayor. The council cabinet's agreed an outline business case to take to the mayoral authority. It says that reopening the airport would bring in between £1 and £2 billion over the next 30 years. It could also create around 6,000 jobs. The mayor for Doncaster says there's still work to be done, but she thinks that the council's on track to reopen the site. I'm very hopeful. Remember, you know, uh, we've still got uh, some way to go. We've got to get the right uh, deal with our lease and we've also got to get the right operator. 
but the economic analysis really tells us that it can be a financially viable airport. So I'm very hopeful. Families of those who died during the COVID pandemic in our region say that they don't accept the apology of Boris Johnson at the inquiry today. The former Prime Minister said sorry to those who lost loved ones, but insisted he did his best under the circumstances. But Lindsay Jackson from North Derbyshire, whose mum Sylvia died during the first wave, said she was disappointed with his evidence. With hindsight, it may be easy to, to see things that we could have done uh, differently, or it may be possible to see things that we could have done differently. At the time, I felt, and I know that everybody else felt, that uh, we were doing our best in very difficult circumstances. He was an opportunity for Boris Johnson to be a statement, statesman, to take accountability for what he did and didn't do. And instead, it was, well, it was what really we should have expected from Boris Johnson, which is, you know, I did my best and it was everybody else's fault. And that was Lindsay Jackson there. Well, there'll be more on the COVID inquiry on the national news, which follows calendar at 6.30. But first, let's go back to Ian at the Dambusters Inn in Scampton. Ian. Yes, thanks very much indeed, Lara. Um, obviously, we're here today at the Dambusters in this place with great history. And it's almost like a living museum here, actually. All the memorabilia and, and artefacts from the time when 617 Squadron were uh, working, saving Britain, the Battle of Britain in, in uh, you know, the Second World War. And what a, what a wonderful place that people just feel so proud of. Now, we're here because the High Court judge today ruled that the Home Office plans to house up to 2,000 asylum seekers at the former RAF Scampton base. Those plans are legal. That was the ruling today. But behind, you know, we talk about illegal immigrants, we talk about asylum seekers. There are human beings, aren't there? So earlier I spoke to Mary Brandon from the charity Asylum Matters and I asked her what she thinks about using places like Scampton to house refugees. Every single person who comes to seek asylum in the UK will have their own story, their own reasons for fleeing, things that they've seen that, and experience that they now need to recover from. And they need a very safe place to do that with stability, with a community around them to support them. And we can't treat them like a, a group who can be segregated and, and forgotten about and kept separate from the rest of society. Um, we need to look after them properly. But of course the government would say that you know, housing asylum seekers in hotels is very costly, so places like RAF Scamp to the former base is perfect. Sites like RAF Scampton and the hotels are completely inappropriate because people need to live in safe housing in our communities. And the reason why people are living in these large scale institutional accommodations is a problem of the government's own making. We need to perform basic administration and process claims quickly, efficiently, fairly, so that people can be in safe housing briefly but then move on with their lives and play a part in society. Uh, there's no need for this large-scale accommodation. We just need to process claims at a suitable rate. Mary, thank you very much indeed for joining us from Asylum Matters. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Well, throughout the programme, we've heard lots of arguments for and against housing asylum seekers at the former RAF Scampton base. But for a lot of people, you know, perhaps people who work there or who've lived on site, it's a very, very important place to them. So let's rejoin Amelia Beckett now. And Amelia, why is RAF Scampton so special to so many people? Well, Ian, we know that Lincolnshire is famous for its countless RAF bases, but it really is no exaggeration to say that many people I've spoken to just say how special Scampton is, partly because, of course, it was the home of the Red Arrows up until last year. And before that, as we've been speaking about throughout this programme, the dam busters, but also it's special because of the deeply personal connections for many people shared across this county, whether they've worked there, know someone who worked there, or just are used to seeing planes in the skies. And the thought that that may now come to an end is sad for so many and also deeply personal. That was indeed a night to remember when the Lancasters of Squadron 617 set course for the Myrna and Ada dams. Their courage and ingenuity captured the world using bouncing bombs to breach German dams. Today, 
The Dam Busters legacy lives on just down the road from where they were formed, at the International Bomber Command Centre in Lincoln. We've obviously got uh, Guy Gibson on the right here and Barnes Wallace who is the designer of the, of the bouncing bomb. Phil volunteers his time to relay that legacy but also his own personal connection to RAF Scampton. I joined the Air Force in 1972. Uh, I flew uh, initially as Sergeant Aircrew on Nimrods for four years and then was commissioned in 77 and came to Lincolnshire uh, where I flew the Vulcan. I spent uh, uh, six months at Scampton doing the Operation Conversion Unit. It's a history shared by many in Bomber County and one they helped capture here, bringing with them stories that could otherwise be lost forever. There had been a, a road accident and they, they just decided to come here and have a coffee. Uh, and I was sharing some of the guides around, so they, they weren't planned to be here. And I was up by the spire and suddenly this guy came around the corner and he was completely in bits. He had just found his father's name on the wall. He didn't even know this place existed. And his father, he never knew his father because his mother was pregnant with him when he was shot down in Lancaster. Places like these help those memories live on. But it was at RAF Scampton where they were forged, and plans that are five years in the making now aim to bring them home. And these four hangars would be where um, aircraft would be stored. And... With aims to preserve both its heritage and its future. One of the clients we're talking to would be looking at bringing back uh, aircraft assembly and checkout uh, back to the UK, which would be the, the first time for a number of years that that's happened. So. Uh, I think it would have a generational impact on, um, on the industry and the, 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 the economy, uh, economy of the UK. That's my grandfather, it's Buckingham Palace, with his daughter, who became my mum. It's already had a generational impact on Greg's family. He spent the last 14 years building his own collection of memorabilia at the Dam Busters Inn. It's the biggest concentration of awards for any raid in the Second World War and any body who has an air crew or ground crew, bomber command, uh, this is the pinnacle for me of what bomber command represents. Uh, my father and my grandfather both served wartime bomber command, so yeah, it's very meaningful. But this is a drop in the ocean of what could be achieved at the site itself, a place with roots that run deep here, which many hope won't be ripped away from generations to come. Amelia Beckett, ITV News, Scampton. Well, I have to say, if you're interested in the history of the Dam Busters or the Red Arrows and the Dam Busters Inn, it is really a great place to come. But as, it, as we saw in that report there, so much memorabilia and history here for you to spend hours looking at, which is amazing. So a new chapter begins for the former RAF Scampton base tonight. Protesters are still there out in force as we speak. It's very, very busy there. That's all from Calendar for this evening. Thanks very much indeed for joining us. And we'll be back again tomorrow night at 6. From us all, a very good night. Good visibility on the horizon. TUI sponsors ITV Yorkshire Weather. Hello, very good evening to you. Dry, clear and cold conditions to start the night, but as we head into the next couple of days, we are going to see a change in our weather conditions. It was minus three Celsius first thing this morning. We've had plenty of sunshine, but by the time we reach tomorrow morning, it will be milder and cloudier and wetter and windier. Unfortunately, other weather words as we head through towards the weekend. So during the course of today, plenty of sunshine, although still feeling chilly, but cloud and rain is waiting in the west, ready to greet us as we head deeper into this evening and overnight tonight. So we start off dry, clear, cold, bit of frost and fog around, but you can see as the night progresses, the cloud thickens and moves across all parts of the region. The winds will freshen, becoming strong and gusty as we head towards the early hours of tomorrow morning. The temperatures lifting, if anything, some low cloud over the hills and initially some showery outbreaks of rain pushing in. 8.04 and 3.42 are your sometimes for tomorrow.
So a cloudy start tomorrow compared to this morning. We are expecting some showery outbreaks of rain. Heaviest of the pulses probably in the west, nudging northwards during the morning. The winds will strengthen through the day. There might be a brief respite to drier conditions, but you can see all this rain in the west, and that's going to come across us all as we head towards late afternoon, early evening. So becoming increasingly unsettled through the day, wet and windy. But you can see the temperatures back to near normal at 6 or 7. So a really unsettled Thursday, that rain pushing its way into the North Sea. And there may be a dry start, a bright start on Friday early on but you can see the low pressure again swirling in the wet and windy spells as we head through Friday and indeed into the weekend so maybe a brief respite Saturday night into Sunday otherwise warmer wetter windier. Tui sponsors ITV Yorkshire weather. Apologies and admissions of the Covid inquiry as Boris Johnson says I should have twigged sooner. How sorry I am for the, the pain and the loss and the suffering. The former PM faced tough questions over his leadership and decision making during the pandemic and accusations of chaos and toxicity at number 10. But did it convince those left suffering and bereaved? He's still not apologising and the country is still in such a mess. It broke, it broke us. Mr Johnson will be back for more tomorrow when he will face further scrutiny. Also tonight. Thank you. In the last half hour, the new migrant deal's been published. Will it satisfy Sunak's MPs? Too little, too late, say the Hillsborough families on the government's response to a major new report on the stadium disaster. Seven councils on the brink this Christmas. Is your local authority edging closer to the financial abyss? And Five Thank you. disappointment for one unlucky contestant. But what happened next? The response I've had is something I could never put into words. Um, I'm going to get upset now. From the bottom of my heart, um, it means the world. This is the ITV Evening News with Mary Nightingale.